Good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Romeo. Next, we're going to talk about two behavioral economic concepts that are loosely related, relativity and anchoring. For both of these topics, I'm going to borrow very, very heavily from Dan Ariely's excellent book, Predictably Irrational. Mr. Ariely opens his book with an ad he saw at The Economist magazine's website. You'll see here that they were offering a web subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, and a print and web subscription for $125. He wondered, who would want to buy the print option alone when the print and web subscriptions were offered at the same price? Well, in behavioral economics, we learn that humans rarely choose things in absolute terms. Rather, we focus on the relative advantage of one thing over another and estimate value accordingly. So we may not know whether the web-only subscription at $59 is better than the print-only option at $125, but we can certainly tell that the print and web option is a better deal than the print-only option at $125. Ariely presented the choice to 100 MIT students. When he presented all three options to them, they chose as follows. 16 went for web, 84 went for print and web, and nobody went for print only, which is not a surprise. But he wanted to know if they were influenced by the mere presence of it, which Ariely calls the decoy. So the next experiment was to remove the decoy, which no one selected the first time around, remember, and see if it affected their response. Rationally, it shouldn't have. But this time, 68 students chose the web subscription, up from 16, and 32 chose the print and web subscription way down from 84. That's a big difference, and it doesn't make rational sense. Their choice was not only irrational, but predictably irrational. When making decisions, we tend to focus on things that are easily comparable and avoid comparing things that cannot be compared easily. Suppose you're shopping for a new house. Your realtor guides you to three houses, all of which interest you and are about the same price. Option one is a Victorian, Option two is a colonial, and option three is a colonial that needs a new roof, so the owner has knocked down the price to cover the additional expense. Which do you choose? The odds are that you will choose option two. Remember, we make decisions based on comparisons. In the case of the Victorian, we don't have another house to compare it with, so it goes to the sidelines. But we do know that one of the colonials is better than the other one, so we will reason that it is better overall. Another example of the decoy effect. When William Sonoma first introduced a home bread maker machine for $275, most consumers were not interested. Flustered by poor sales, they brought in a marketing firm which suggested a fix. Introduce an additional model of the bread maker, one that was not only larger, but priced 50% higher than the initial machine. Sales rose because people didn't have to make their decision in a vacuum. Now they could say, well, I don't know much about bread makers, but I do know that if I were to buy one, I'd rather have the smaller one for less money. Marketers do this all the time. Take Sam, the television salesman. He plays the same general trick on us when he decides what televisions to put together on a display. Sam knows that customers find it difficult to compare the value of different options, but he also knows that given three choices, most people will take the middle choice. So which TV does Sam put as the middle option? The one he wants to sell. Maybe that middle option is the one he has more inventory of or makes a higher profit margin on. Another example. Ariely talks about Greg Rapp, a restaurant consultant. Rapp gets paid to work out the pricing for menus. One thing he's learned is that a high-priced entree on a menu boosts revenue for the restaurant even if nobody buys it. Why? Because even though people won't generally buy the most expensive dish on the menu, they will order the second most expensive dish. Thus, by creating an expensive dish, a clever restaurateur can lure customers into ordering the second most expensive choice, which can be engineered to deliver a higher profit margin. Now think about yourself. Suppose you have two errands to run today. The first one is to buy a new alarm clock. At the store, you select a nice alarm clock for $25 and are set to buy it. When another customer comes up to you and tells you the same clock is on sale for $18 at a different store 15 minutes across town. Think about it, the chance to save $7. What would you do? Most people, when faced with this dilemma, say they would take the trip across town to save the $7. The second errand you have to run today is to buy a new suit. 
You find the perfect suit for $455 and decide to buy it. Then another customer whispers in your ear that the exact same suit is on sale for only $448 at another store, just 15 minutes away. Would you make the trip? In this case, most people say they would not. But what is going on here? Is 15 minutes of your time worth $7 or isn't it? Rationally, $7 is $7. Whether the amount from which this $7 will be saved is $10 or $10,000 should be irrelevant. But this is the problem with relativity. We look at our decisions in a relative way and compare them to the available alternative. Here's a visual representation of relativity. Look at the blue circles in the middle. They're the same size. But when the blue circle is placed among larger circles, it gets smaller. When it's placed among smaller circles, it gets larger. It's all relative. Here's one more demonstration of relativity to make it easy to remember. You got a light, buddy? Yeah, sure, kid. There you go. And your wallet. Nick, give him your wallet. What for? He's got a knife. <laughs> That's not a knife. That's a knife. So that's relativity. Let's move on to the concept of anchoring. But first, let me tell you a story about Donald Duck. When Donald Duck turned 50 years old in 1984, Disneyland planned a parade to celebrate. Their PR director had the idea to have 50 white ducks follow Donald down Main Street and board a special float just for them. They reached out to some animal experts and were told, yes, it was possible but Donald would have to bond with the 50 ducks from birth. Ducklings and goslings become attached to the first moving object they encounter, which is generally their mother. This is called imprinting. So they arranged for Donald to be in the hatchery when those fuzzy little ducklings broke out of their shells. Months later, those ducks followed him in the parade each day. Not only did the ducks incorrectly imprint Donald as their mother, but they stuck with that loyalty through their adolescence. Their first impressions stayed imprinted. Are our brains wired the same way? When we encounter a new product, for example, do we accept the first price that comes before our eyes? And more importantly, does that price, which we call an anchor, have a long-term effect on our willingness to pay for that product from then on? Let me tell you about an interesting experiment. 55 MIT students were presented with various products two bottles of wine, a cordless trackball, a cordless keyboard and mouse, a book, and a box of chocolates. The researchers passed out forms that listed all the products. At the top of the page, the students wrote down the last two digits of their social security numbers and then put that number next to each of the items listed in the form of a price. Next, they were to indicate whether they would pay that amount for each of the products. After that, the students were asked the maximum amount they would be willing to pay for each of the items. Now when asked if writing down the last two digits of their social security numbers influenced their answers, the students unanimously insisted, no way. Then the data was analyzed. Did the total random digits from the social security numbers serve as anchors? Yes, they did. The students with the highest ending social security numbers from 80 to 99 bid highest, while those with the lowest ending numbers, 01 to 20, bid lowest. For example, the highest numbered 20% bid an average of $56 for the cordless keyboard, and the lowest numbered 20% bid an average of $16. My uncle used to work at a department store, and he said that when new clothes were delivered to the store and they opened the boxes, not only were the price tags already on the clothes, but sometimes there was a sticker on top of the tag with the sale price. The store was trying to anchor you to the original price and then show you what a good deal you were getting with the sale price. First impressions are important and affect our emotions. If you remember that your first DVD player cost $400, in comparison, today's prices are a steal. But if you remember that gas used to be less than a dollar a gallon, that makes every trip to the gas station a painful experience. So that's a little bit about anchoring and relativity. Thanks everyone.